So our next speaker is Bill um, Aklomaso from Kwame Guruma University of Science Technology in Ghana, who will present on secondary bacterial infections in filariasis patients with implications of multi-drug resistance. So the floor is yours, Bill. Switch on your video, unmute yourself, and you can share your screen. Ah, perfect. Um, hello, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see the, your screen and hear you well. Okay, all right. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, um, good morning, wherever you are hearing us from. Um, so my name is uh, Bill Clinton Aglomasa. And for me, my research wants to put smiles on people that are infected with lymphatic filariasis. Um, especially because it is associated with uh, disability and also um, morbidity. And so for today's presentation, I'm particularly uh, thankful to the BSI initiative, and I'll be presenting on secondary bacterial infections in lymphatic filariasis patients, and I'll be looking at the implications of multi-drug resistance. All right, so um, comorbidity is a condition due to the presence of two or more diseases. And on the African continent, comorbidity mostly is as a result of infectious disease, um, diseases. And this comorbidity is also occurring in other parts of the world in non-infectious diseases too as well. But on the African continent, one of the causes is neglected tropical diseases. Now, neglected tropical diseases are basically diseases um, that are less research upon and they are mostly infectious um, diseases. So from this picture, you can see clearly that on the African continent, um, mostly two or more neglected diseases are probably implicated in um, the countries. And one of those is lymphatic filariasis. So lymphatic filariasis is a neglected tropical disease that is caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. And in fact, it accounts for 90% of the cases. And indeed, the progression of the disease actually leads to acute dermatolymphadenitis, which is as a result of um, subcutaneous or cutaneous um, inflammations that also occur in the lymph vessels and that of the lymph nodes as well. And these begin to serve as entry points for bacterial infections. So this is the distribution of lymphatic filariasis, and you tend to realize that in the tropics, it is still ongoing, although they have been a decrease in the microfilaria in the blood. Currently in Ghana, it's around 2% thereabout, and the World Health Organization is looking at limiting it to less than 1%. So microfilaria, so for the microfilaria, um, one of the conservative organisms, as I've rightly said, is Wuchereria bancrofti. And it basically begins when it, is, um, it enters the human body through the vector, which is mosquitoes. And what it does is that it finds its way in the afferent uh, lymphatic vessels. And at this point, from five to six years, it begins to exhibit some immuno uh, modulatory effects so that it can stay on for five to six years and be able to sort of um, proliferate. So for the pathogenesis of the disease, there are two schools of thoughts. Um, one argues that it is an acute filarial lymphadenitis, which basically means is that um, it is an inflammation that results from the microfilaria. And so the host begin to, uh, um, so the host begin to sort of mount um, uh, immune response to the microfilaria. 
And so in that, it sort of results in granulomatous reaction and therefore it leads to nodal formation. And basically this nodal formation results because of the fact that the lymph vessels are trying to repair themselves, but it is not 100%. And so the apaches whereby they are not strong. And so in the process whereby there is continuous uh, accumulation of uh, lymph in the lymphatic vessels, it can explode and then result in bacterial infection. The other school of thought also argues that um, it is due to dermatoalymphoadenitis, where basically the presence of the microfilaria results in inflammations of the connective tissues. Um, and so in the long run, it leads into um, the tissues getting inflamed, which sort of leads to um, bacterial infection. And so if you see A, A is a classical example of um, acute filaria um, lymphoadenitis, which results in nodal formation. But that of the D, you tend to see that a lot of um, the tissues are sort of inflamed, which is another form of the pathogenesis. So what we realized in Ghana was that um, because of the bacterial infection, a lot of the patients actually resort to antibiotics and mobility management where they try to prevent the infection of the opportunistic um, bacterial uh, organisms. So however, in the current dispensation where we realize that there's a lot of antimicrobial resistance that is occurring and that for these lymphatic filariasis patients, we are seeing that um, therapy isn't really effective, especially with the antibiotics. We tend to see that their wounds are non-healing. And so there was a need to look at uh, unique pathobionts that are implicated in these secondary bacterial infections. Previous studies have also alluded to the fact that these bacterial infections are also part of um, uh, uh, um, exacerbating the uh, infections. And so for us, we decided to focus on the wounds. And so we cultured bacteria isolates that were coming from the wounds. Then we resorted to Maditov to identify the bacteria, which uh, certainly uh, prints a, a, a graph that sort of helps in the identification of the bacteria. Then again, we looked at um, unique genes that are known to hydrolyze some of the um, antibiotics. And so first, one of the aim was to look at the antibiotic usage. It was important so that we understand some of the antibiotics that these patients were using. And it was fascinating, and, but really not surprising that Victor Lactam antibiotics uh, was the highest antibiotics that they were taking. Over the world, to Victor Lactam have been in existence for a long time, and so this was generally expected. So having done that, it was also important to look at the resistant isolates that were coming from the, um, or, um, the wounds that we took. And what we realized was that for staph warriors, we realized that they were resistant to P, that is penicillin gene. And for the gram negative two, we saw that AM, which is some penicillin, and that of uh, SAM, which are all penicillin based. We realized that there was a high resistance in that area. And this draws home the fact that it is because of selective pressure, because these patients have been taking a lot of these antibiotics, and therefore these organisms have sort of find means of uh, evading uh, such antibiotics. So having done that, it was then important to look at the multi-drug resistant organisms. Why? Because these are mostly implicated in severe forms of the uh, 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 wound infections. And so what we realized was that for methicillin resistant staph warriors, we tend to realize that um, for the multi-drug resistance, um, um, one of the antibiotics that we are sort of uh, uh, channeling or sort of arguing that it should be used in the mobility uh, management is that of CTX because it was really um, effective at treating uh, the methicillin resistant staph warriors. Then again, we look at E. coli. For E. coli, we realized that we got very um, small number of isolates, but it was a bit worrying because for Ghana and most parts of the world, meropenem, which comes from the carbapenem groups class, 
what comes from the cabepinem class of antibiotics, we realized that for this case, that was the only antibiotic that was actually able to um, sort of uh, kill the E. coli. And it is a bit worrying because it sort of leads to pan drug resistance, whereby an organism may be able to, an organism becomes resistant to at least one antibiotic in every class. And this will particularly worrying because it therefore reduces the number of uh, antibiotics that can be used in treatment. Then pseudomonas or inosa to look at the multi-drug resistant um, isolates. What was fascinating here was that um, ciprofloxacin, which is the CIP, was particularly very effective at um, treating the multi-drug resistance. But for meropenem, which is one of the best antibiotics for treating this um, patient, uh, for treating this isolate, um, we realized that it wasn't particularly effective. And so we are also recommending that for these uh, patients, lymphatic filariasis patients, we may sort of want to look at um, using ciprofloxacin to also um, manage their treatment. Then finally, we looked at resistant genes. If you look at objective one and objective two, you begin to realize that a lot of um, the organisms are resistant to that of Victor lactam antibiotics. And so it was important to look at resistant genes that sort of um, are able to hydrolyze these antibiotics. And what we found that was that indeed MEK-A and BLACTXM, which are very important in Victor lactam resistant were also fine here. And so what this means is that these pathobionts in secondary bacterial infections in LF is concerning. It is concerning because these uh, patients are really immunocompromised. And therefore, if we are using um, empirical treatment without doing a lot of research into which antibiotics and which organisms are occurring in these populations, then we may not really be treating some of the secondary infections that are occurring in this population. And so for us as a group, what we are proposing now is to be able to look at the mobility management and to factor in an, an antimicro antibiotic therapy that will be effective for treating uh, this uh, population. Then again, what we are currently doing is that we want to expand this project and to be able to look at other parts of the country. That may give us a holistic uh, overview of the resistant genes that are occurring in these lymphatic filariasis patients. And this, in the long run, will be able to um, improve therapy for these patients. And so we are trying to write grants as well. And so if people are here who are interested, hopefully we are also interested in um, collaborating with them. And so I want to thank my supervisors, my team members, and the university and the research centers that I did um, this study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Um, really um, interesting study that I had not really thought uh, about. And it's very, um, it's very important uh, that more sample sizes are recruited and maybe guidelines can be implemented based on um, what findings are, are, are obtained for either empirical uh, or even prophylactic treatment and so that the disease, uh, the, rather the infection does not progress and um, can be controlled well early. So we have two questions, but I think I'll just um, filter one. Um, is a uh, question is, is lymph transfusion helpful uh, in such a treatment approach? Um, it's not really helpful because the lymph are already inflamed. And so the best treatment normally is uh, amputation but that sort of brings about disability issues. And so a lot of people don't really go for this. And so what, if you're able to detect it early, what we do is that we sort of manage it so that you don't get infections, which can sort of in the long run worsen it. And so lymph um, therapy really isn't 
um, the solution here. But we've seen other cases in advanced countries where some of them have actually looked at therapy, especially taking some of the inflamed one out and sort of restructuring the lymph. That have sort of improved it a bit, but it hasn't really solved um, the problem itself. Okay, so another question. Uh, do you think, do you think, um, okay, what are the preventive and promotive strategies that have been, pla been uh, placed in, in your country? And uh, what else do you think, do you think maybe a multidisciplinary team effort should uh, now be sought after whenever getting a case to discuss um, implications uh, so that you have a medical, surgical, and even infectious disease team on board um, to curb even resistance, but also now follow specific protocols? Uh, thank you very much for the question. So for in my country, what we are basically doing now is the mobility management where for those who have the lymphedema, you sort of prevent infection. So you want to clean the area so that you prevent infections. Then in some cases, you want to raise the leg. That is in the early stages because there's a retrograde edema. Sometimes it regresses. And so once you raise the leg, it sort of moves the lymph out of those uh, places and, 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 and bring it back into the blood and into the circulation in the long run. Um, some of them also want to use uh, leggings, which sort of tighten the area to sort of prevent the accumulation of lymph. Um, so in our parts of the world, what we are currently doing is that we are beginning to work with clinicians because these uh, infections normally occur in very remote regions where they don't have uh, very good facilities. And therefore, they, these patients who are treated normally like um, those who have immunocompetent um, uh, immune system, which really isn't helping. And so what we are arguing is that we want to get a lot of scientists, um, a lot of um, doctors in that area to then be able to look at um, device and means of really um, treating these patients. And so for, for and so one of the objectives too is that um, from the study, we realized that um, phenotypically some of the resistant isolates were resistant, but we didn't find the genes. And this, uh, this also means that there could be some form of mutation and therefore there's a need to look at sequencing to, uh, to be able to address um, this issue. Okay, I think it's uh, good to even chime in on primary healthcare facilities uh, for those un um, underserved populations. Payam? I, I can also ask in the chat. In the interest of time. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Bill, for this really uh, interesting talk, and we hope it can be expanded, as you mentioned, uh, so that more better strategies are, are sought after. Thank you. All right, thank you too.